The Prophecy Club, a nationwide television program, a nationwide radio program. The Prophecy Club also hosts approximately 40 major city meetings per month. is to inform Christians of current events that confirm Bible prophecy, expose the evil devices of Satan, warn believers what is coming to America, challenge people to stop sinning and turn to Jesus with all their heart, and to provide a platform for Christian speakers to be heard. It's a bald-faced lie. Using the positions of power and authority in our own government. The greatest oil field in the world is at the southwest end of the Dead Sea. He said, son, you must warn this nation. And now your host for the Prophecy Club, Stan Johnson. Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we provide information and resources with a prophetic warning message to win souls to Jesus and to call people to repentance. Our topic today is 2045, now that's the year, 2045, is this the year that man becomes immortal? Your speaker has basically been raised in ministry. His father was a pastor and uh, so raised up in church. He's written two books, seven DVDs, an international public speaker, mostly on Bible prophecy and radio host. Will you help me welcome Rob Skiba? God bless you, brother. Thank you, Sam. All right, good morning. Good morning. We're, yes, we're going to be talking about 2045, the year a man becomes immortal. But in order to get there, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a back history. So we're going to go all the way back actually to pre-flood times and work our way forward from there. I hope you're ready to listen fast because I'm ready to speak fast. <laughs> We've got a lot of a ground to cover in a short period of time. So uh, the title uh, of the presentation is 2045, the year a man becomes immortal. It's actually taken from the content mostly from my second book, Archon Invasion, The Rise, Fall, and Return of the Nephilim, and a series of DVDs by the same title. Now, I said Archon, so I need to define who or what is an Archon. That may not be a, a, a term many people are familiar with. So, we have an example of an Archon in Ephesians 2.2. 2. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The word highlighted there, prince, is in, in, in English, it's prince, but in Greek, it's archon. It's simply a masculine noun that means chief, ruler, prince, leader, commander with authority. So in the context of this talk, an archon, as, as far as what I'm going to be presenting, uh, are the leaders of the 200 watcher class angels that landed on Mount Hermon in the days of Jared and produced what I call the Genesis 6 experiment, where they mated with women and produced the offspring called the Nephilim. Everybody with me so far? Okay, the Genesis 6 experiment, that's simply my term, that's what I use to describe Genesis 6, 1 through 4, that act of angels coming down and mating with women. We see that in Genesis 6, 1 and 2, that it was the sons of God that saw the daughters of men, that they were fair and they took wives of all which they chose. Now, it's important to understand that that phrase, sons of God, is a, 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 represents angels. We see, we see elsewhere that the sons of God, like in the book of Job, is, is a phrase referring to angels. The extra-biblical texts refer to that as well in books such as the uh, first book of First Enoch, chapter 6, same verses 1 and 2. I told you last night that there were the synchronized, biblically-endorsed extra-biblical te text. Well, you see they synchronize even to the chapter and verse right here. Ver uh, we saw Genesis 6, 1 and 2, and this is First Enoch 6, 1 and 2. It talks about the angels, the children of the heaven, right there, okay? Uh, and in the book of Jubilees, it also comes right out and tells you that it was the angels of God that participated in this activity. Even the well-respected first century historian Josephus refers to this situation as angels mating with women. Okay, so the ancient record is clear. Modern seminaries today, however, change it. They tell you stuff about what's called the Sethite theory. They say that the sons of God are the good sons of Seth mating with the bad daughters of Cain. Well, as you saw in Genesis 6, it doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say anything about Seth and, and Cain. No, it's garbage. Uh, but unfortunately, that's what the, the uh, seminaries teach their pastors, and that's what pastors teach you, and that's why people are clueless as to what's going on there. But the ancient record testifies that it was, in fact, angels that were mating with women. 
where did this uh, activity take place? Well, the Genesis 6 uh, experiment happened right there in the crosshairs. If you look at the crosshairs on that map right there, uh, and an individual by the name of David Flynn discovered, and you can actually check this out for yourself. You could go to Google Earth, find Mount Hermon, which is in Lebanon, look for the center of the mountain range, put your cursor there, and you're going to see that depending on where your cursor lands, it's going to be pretty close to 33.33 by 33.33. Now, it's 33.33 degrees north by 33.33 degrees east from the Paris Prime Meridian. Google Earth is going to give you the Greenwich Prime Meridian. Okay, so you'll have to subtract the difference. You have to look up what, what, what's the difference between Greenwich and Paris and, you know, subtract the difference, and you're going to end up with 33.33. What, what percentage of the angels fell with Lucifer? One-third, right? Which 33.33%. So how interesting that one-third of the angels, a platoon, let's say, of 200 angels uh, of the one-third landed on the only geographical landmass location on the planet that fits their number. You'll see down the bottom there is another crosshair, but you end up in the ocean. See? So they landed right on the crosshairs, 33.33 by 33.33. David Flint also discovered that uh, when he took his little uh, line on uh, Google Earth to see how long it was, how, what the distance was, he, he realized that it was 2,012 nautical miles from that location to the Paris Prime Meridian and 2,012 nautical miles from that location to the equator. So that, again, caused a lot of people to be thinking, what's going on with the 2012 thing? Um, this is Mount Hermon today. This is what it looks like today. Uh, this is where Genesis 6-4 took place. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. That's where it happened right there. Now, Nephilim, let's briefly discuss Nephilim. Who or what are Nephilim? Well, it comes, uh, it's Strong's number 5303. It comes from the word nafal, properly. You know, a lot of words are derived from other words. This word's derived, it's a plural word that derives from this word nafal, which most people will say uh, the definition is to fall. And that's true. You can see up there the definition. Well, it's got a whole lot of definitions, though, doesn't it? Not just to fall. That's the one definition most people look at. But as you can see, there are many other definitions up there, including cast down, cease, die, divide by lot, let fail, to fall, inferior, be judged, rot, slay, smite out, throw down. It has a lot of different meanings. In fact, the word is used 435 times in your Bible, only about twice in reference to angels mating with humans. Okay, so it's a fairly common word. Derived from the word nephal, nephilim are often said to be the fallen ones. Some associate the Nephilim with being the fallen angels themselves. Not so. Uh, the text seems to clearly indicate that the fallen angels were watchers and that they gave birth to Nephilim. Uh, when, well, the women did, anyway. They, they mated with the women who gave birth to Nephilim. Uh, they are the offspring of the angels. Put more simply, Nephilim can be defined as those which are fallen from their original state, i.e. the way God created them to be. Can Nephilim be produced in other ways besides being the offspring of angels? Now, many scholars would say, no, the only way you can create Nephilim is for angels to mate with women. But I'm going to suggest that uh, there are other ways that Nephilim can be produced. And I believe the Bible testifies to that in Numbers 13.33, for instance, where it talks about that these giants, the Nephilim, were from other giants. So we can see that Nephilim can be produced from other Nephilim, as well as from angels mating with women. And I'm going to suggest one other way as we move forward in this talk. Now, last night I mentioned the additional resources that I call the Synchronized Biblically Endorsed Extra Biblical Texts. These are these three books right here, books of uh, First Enoch, Joshua, and Jubilees. When you take these books along with Scripture, now again, I told you I, I hold the Bible in the highest esteem, and everything, that's my touchstone. If it conflicts with what I read in the Bible, that information I throw out. If it only elaborates and confirms Scripture, great, it's added information. The Bible refers to these books, quotes from these books, seems to be endorsing these books because the Holy Spirit inspired the writers to mention them and quote from them. Everybody with me? When you take these three books and the book of Genesis together, it tells an extremely detailed story of what happened in the days of Jared and in the Genesis 6 experiment. Each book gives a little bit more detail. What one doesn't cover, another one does. So I found some very interesting things when I looked through all that. What I really was intrigued about uh, in the book of Enoch is you open up the book of Enoch, first few verses that you'll read in chapter 1, first two verses, says, The words of the blessing of Enoch, with which he blessed the elect and righteous, who will be living in the day of tribulation. This right, right, the first verse. 
it's telling, you know, everything we talked about in the previous sessions, you know, if we believe we're going to be here, we believe in the, we're here in the last days and we're going to see this tribulation thing. Well, Enoch says this book is actually for those who will be living in that day. That's why I believe it was preserved, I think, for such a time as this and popped out of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1948, one year after Roswell. New Mexico in the modern era began of UFOs. Uh, I think it was preserved for such a time as this, when all the wicked and godless are to be removed, which I thought was pretty interesting too, especially uh, as I started moving off the pre-trib rapture page, because it says, who's, who's getting removed? Yeah, getting the, the bad guys, the tares, right? Good guys are staying, bad guys are going. This is our planet, guys. God made this place for us. They got to go, not us. Well, what happened in the days of Noah? Did Noah leave the planet? He was lifted up just for a minute. <laughs> In God's time, <laughs> you know, he was lifted up for a little while. All the bad guys were washed away, and he was brought back down. This is our destination. We, we, we come back here, right? If we die or whatever, we're, New Jerusalem, where does it come? Down here. Where do we have the millennial reign of Christ? Right here. This is our place. They got to go. Uh, verse 2, And he began his story, saying, Enoch, a righteous man, whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the holy ones in heaven, which the angels showed me. And I heard everything from them, and I saw and understood. But it was not for this generation, but for a remote future one which is to come. First two verses tell you it's all about helping us understand what's going on today. So uh, Jesus said, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming of the Son of Man. We have to understand what was going on in those pre-flood world days, as well as in the post-flood world. So I created this timeline here because I'm a visual person. I like to look at things visually. So uh, the first generation Nephilim were produced in the Genesis 6 experiment, I believe, about 3550 B.C. And I based that on timelines by people like Dr. Ken Johnson, uh, Bishop Usher, other people uh, using the chronologies in Scripture. Uh, you know, it gives you pretty detailed information about how long these guys lived and who begat what. And every, you can kind of backtrack and figure out the timeline uh, that way. So... Uh, assuming creation was roughly 4,000 B.C., I believe the Genesis 6 experiment took place in the days of Jared at 3550 B.C. But Enoch tells you that the first generation Nephilim in chapter 10 would only live for 500 years. And in that time, they were to kill each other off in a massive civil war that the Greeks stylized into what became known as the Clash of the Titans. Have you heard that? Mm -hmm. Clash of the Titans movie came out a few years ago. All right, so... Going forward in the timeline from 500 years puts you roughly in the, third, the 3000 B.C. time frame. And as you see, as you get close to 3000 B.C., a lot of interesting things start happening, like the Mayan calendar I talked about in the previous sessions. Shows up 3114 B.C. Very shortly after that, Adam, the first man, dies. Shortly after that, the first generation Nephilim have finished killing each other off in the Clash of the Titans. That's 1 Enoch 10.10. And then their parents, the Watchers, are judged, bound, and buried for 70 generations at somewhere around 3000 B.C. Uh, and then Enoch gets raptured. He, he walked with God and was not, for God took him, right? He gets raptured. And then roughly 70 years later, uh, Noah is born and his daddy names him Rest. Well, that just makes sense because he was born after the Clash of the Titans. And everybody kind of took a deep breath and said, ah, rest. There is no further written documentation of any other incursions of angels mating with women in any text that I've been able to see so far. It's not in your Bible, nor is it in the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra-biblical text. Although a lot of scholars believe that there was a second incursion, I constantly challenge them to give me a textual proof for it. It's all based on assumption. Uh, but the Bible tells us something quite different, I believe. Now, what really stood out to me is looking at the names. Uh, oh, man, I don't have the book in front of me. There's a book called a, a, a Dictionary of Scripture Proper Names by J.B. Jackson. Best $5 I ever spent because all it is is all the names in the Bible and the Hebrew meaning, what the meanings of their names are. And you'll find that there are a lot of hidden codes in your Bible in the names. We know that people named their children for a reason, right? You know, Esau came out red and hairy, so they named him Red and Hairy. <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's what Esau means. You know, and Jacob came out holding his heel, so they named him Heel Grabber, right? So we see that people name their children for reasons. Well, this clearly shows that God had his hand in the naming of the first ten patriarchs in your Bible. You see Adam's, it, the meanings of his name. His name means man, Seth, appointed, etc. You see all the meanings right there. Well, Dr. Chuck Missler realized when you look at that, you could string it together in a sentence and this is what you end up with. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. 
That's the entire plan of God right there in the names of the first ten patriarchs. How incredible is that? Now, when you see all those genealogies that you usually skip past because you can't read, you don't, you don't know how to pronounce their names, right? <laughs> you know, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, and you're like, yeah, whatever. Uh, get that little book out, and you'll see all kinds of really cool things showing up in your Bible. Not every time, but a lot of times when you string the meanings of their names together and put, the, put them in the same order, just like Chuck Missler did here, you find really cool stuff. Now, as I looked at the reason why they named these people what they named them, Jared was named shall come down because that's when the watchers came down. They came down in the days of Jared. Enoch was named teaching because that's what he did. His whole thing was teaching against the activity of the watchers. Methuselah, his name means his death shall bring and has the connotation of judgment. Judgment is coming. When he dies, the flood's going to come. And sure enough, he died seven days later, the flood waters came. All right? Uh, now, of course, if you're Methuselah and you know that's what your name means and you know well, that's what's going to happen when you die and you have a kid, it kind of makes sense you name your kid despairing. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Lamech was born during the time that the, that the clash of the titans was taking place. Clearly a time of despairing. But then, like I said, that war ended, the Nephilim were gone and destroyed, and Noah's daddy named him Rest. He was born after the first generation Nephilim was over. Fascinating stuff. So let's talk about the Genesis 6-4 pre-flood return of the Nephilim. Because I showed you in that chart that the first generation Nephilim are dead, and there's, but there's still 700 more years left till you get to the flood. So what happened in that 700 years after the first generation Nephilim are dead that got God so mad that he had to destroy the world with a flood? Something else took place. And I'm going to suggest it's a pre-flood return of the Nephilim. Everybody talks about the post-flood return. I'm like, ah, you got to go back a little bit. So let's synchronize Genesis to the extra-biblical text that I've been talking about. I'm not going to read the yellow, so you can just kind of take note of it, just for the sake of time. Genesis 6, 1 through 4 talks about angels mating with humans. Syncs up with the text that you see there. Genesis 6, 5 through 7 shows how God feels about the resulting violence. See the text that it syncs up with there. Genesis 6, 8 through 10 reveals how Noah and his sons were genetically pure. Remember we covered that word in the previous sessions? The word tamim, genetically pure, syncs up with the text that you see there. Genesis 6, 11 and 12 says the earth and all flesh becomes corrupted. How much is all? Okay, so we're all in agreement that all means all. It's the stain lifter, it's all. <laughs> yeah, well, that syncs up with the text that you see there. Sorry, random commercials just popping in your head. Genesis 6, 13 through 17, God grows increasingly angry and tells Noah how to build the ark. That syncs up with the text that you see there. And then Genesis 6, 18, we get the first mention of the wives of Noah's three sons. Quick quiz. Does 18 come before or after 12? So 18 comes after 12. We all agree? And all means all. Therefore, these three women are suspect in my eyes because they would have to fall into the category of all flesh having become corrupted. You follow? Okay. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. That's Genesis 6, 12. That's what it says. It syncs up with the text that I showed you before, but I'm going to actually show you. I'm going to read it to you right now. Joshua 4, 18 tells you how all flesh became corrupted. It says, And their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the air, and taught the mixture of animals of one species with, one, uh, w with the other in order therewith to provoke the Lord. And God saw the whole earth, and it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways on the earth, all men and all animals." There's the rest of the story right there, confirmed by another book, Jubilees, chapter 7, verse 24, where it says, and after this. I underline that because my, my contention is, is that the phrase after this that we see right there in Jubilees 7, 24 is identical to the phrase and after that of Genesis 6, 4. The giants were in the earth in those days and also after that. It's in a pre-flood context. Most Nephilim scholars will take that after that and say that's talking about the post-flood guys in Numbers 13:33, etc. I'm like, no, the entire chapter is in a pre-flood context, and the synchronized extra-biblical text gives you even more detail to prove that, that, that. The verses prior to verse 24 talk about the first generation Nephilim killing each other off and the watchers being judged. It says, and after this, which is still 700 years before the flood, they sinned against the beasts and birds and all that moveth and walketh on the earth. 
And much blood was shed on the earth, and every imagination and desire of men imagined vanity and evil continually. That's uh, more detail there, because I always wonder, what, what would make people have only evil continually? I mean, the Nazis were pretty bad people, right? But they still had tender moments with their loved ones, their children, their wives, whatever. They didn't have only evil continually in their heart and mind. So I wonder, well, what would cause somebody to have only evil continually? And I believe it's this. When they started mixing species together and blending DNA with themselves, it had unfortunate side effects. Everybody ha ends up being only evil continually. Anybody see the last Spider-Man movie that came out? This guy over here. In the movie, there's a guy, the doctor, who is missing uh, his arm from the elbow down. He, he's amputee. And uh, he desired to obviously get his arm back and was looking for research because uh, to help, first of all, get his own arm back, but help other people who are missing limbs and stuff like that. So he's studying lizards and how you can chop a lizard's tail off, you know, and there's limb regeneration that grows back. He's like, well, what is the genetic code? Excuse me. What is the genetic code that enables that to happen? So he does some tests with rats. They cuts the rat's legs off, whatever, and puts, injects the rat with lizard DNA until they finally get a, a viable subject, and it works, and the, and the rat's uh, leg grows back. And he's like, oh, okay, it works. So then he injects himself with it, and sure enough, his arm grows back. But he has a very unfortunate side effect. He becomes a giant lizard man that has only evil continually in his heart and mind. I'm like, wow, Hollywood gets it. I mean, the church is still arguing about the Sethite theory, but Hollywood's like telling you exactly what's going on. And I believe it perfectly illustrates that. I mean, he was fine. He was a good guy. He had good intentions of helping people. But as soon as he did that, boo, everything changed. I think that's exactly what happened in the pre-flood world. Now, sinned against the animals is a reference to genetic manipulation, which created the animal-human hybrids of mythology. We talked about that in a previous session. Which appears to have made a way for the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim to have host bodies to once again inhabit thus bringing about the return. What am I talking about? I have to clarify something first. There's a difference between fallen angels and demons. A lot of people think fallen angels and demons are one or the same. They're not. Angels are, first of all, fallen angels are just regular angels that rebelled. I mean, there's not, physically there's nothing different from the other angels. They were just rebellious. Uh, they get around just fine with the bodies that they have, right? But demons are always looking for a body to get into. Remember when the maniac of Gadara, the legion, you know, and he was going to cast out legion, and they're like, please don't send us to the abyss. We're, we're, send us into the pigs. <laughs> right? They needed a body to get into. Right? Well, Enoch tells you where demons come from. When you kill a Nephilim, the offspring of angels mating with humans, their spirit leaves their body because it was never meant to exist in the first place and becomes a wandering evil spirit called a demon. Demons are disembodied spirits of dead Nephilim. That's where demons come from. Now, so when you create something like this, I believe, you know, when Scripture says everything must reproduce after its own kind, right? When it's, Scripture says that God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul, the word soul there is nefesh. It's the same word used elsewhere where it says the living creatures, when he created the living creatures, nefesh. I believe there, that's the life force that, that God puts into embryos, you know, at the moment of conception. I believe there is a God-prescribed nefesh for each kind. That's why God said everything must reproduce after what? Its own kind. So there's a God-prescribed nefesh for a bird, for a cat, for a dog, a horse, human. God-prescribed nefesh for each different time, each different kind, right? And they're not supposed to be blended together. So I wondered, well, what if you blend a human and a goat? You don't have a God-prescribed nefesh to go into it, do you? Because they're two different kinds. So what did you do? I think all you did is create a host body that's fit for another spirit, Nefesh, to go into it. And there's a whole lot of those disembodied spirits out there from the dead Nephilim, both from the Clash of the Titans as well as what was destroyed in the flood. Dr. Judd Burton wrote a book called Interview with a Giant, and he had a really interesting quote in his book here. He says, Despite the loss of their physical bodies, there is reason to believe that the giant's spirits continued to exist. In this state, they were and are demonic entities, like other sentient creatures, they have an eternal spirit at their essence. Therefore, the Nephilim and related tribes of giants never really ceased to exist. Only their physicality was lost. And they kept wanting physicality to get back into. So I think plan B was, okay, there's no more angel incursions. The, the, the judgment of the watchers was extremely severe, such that no other angels is going to do that again because they saw what happened to those guys. They're like, whoa, okay. No, we don't want to do that. So what's plan B? Well, let's uh, 
blend species together, and that way the, the disembodied spirits of the previously killed Nephilim can come back to life. You with me? So that's what I think happens when you actually create Chimera. I think it's very dangerous. I think it's another variety of Nephilim. I expanded the chart here to show you what I believe happened in the end also after that latter-day corruption of all flesh. In the last 120 years leading up to, to the flood, the last 120 years of uh, Methuselah's life, Okay, we see in Genesis 6-3 where it says, My spirit will no longer dwell with man, right? For his days shall be 120 years. I believe that the reason for that is because our body is what to God? The temple for the Holy Spirit, right? We are a fit extension, if you will, for the Holy Spirit to inhabit. But if you start corrupting this house, his spirit says, Well, I can't go there anymore. That's what I think was going on as they started corrupting their temple such that God said, My spirit's not going to be able to dwell with man anymore i got to do something about this. This all of a sudden, this whole flood thing becomes an extreme act of love and mercy for God's true creation because man was corrupting all of it, including himself. And if we take a strict view of the last days being a parallel to the days of Noah, how many people are on the planet today? Over 7 billion people. That means, I believe, about 7 billion people were corrupted, all flesh, in, at the time of the flood. And I believe that's what was going on there. Now, I teased you last night when I said, who created the dinosaurs? If you remember, I showed you a, a, a diagram that's similar to this one that showed T-Rex there. And I just kind of teased you, who created the dinosaurs? Well, let's talk about it here. I believe God created the dinosaurs. Job 40, and this is one of my litmus tests when I'm looking for Bibles and looking at different translations and stuff, is I always turn to this passage right here to see if they use the word behemoth. Uh, a lot of translations don't. They substitute that word for something like a hippo, which I think is completely absurd when you read this text. Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee, and eateth grass as an ox. So he's telling you that he's a vegetarian creature, first of all. Lo, now his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar, like a cedar tree. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach him. Interesting. I believe that is a description of this right here. God's proud of that. He's telling Job, look at that. His tail moves like a cedar tree. Now, if your translation says hippo, ever see the tail of a hippo? <laughs> you know, I, I'm pointing it out to you there because it's pretty absurd. How in the world the translators ever got away with that? Hippo or elephant? I'll never know because you're like, oh, behold now the hippo. His tail moves like a cedar tree. Really? No. I think it's talking about a sauropod class dinosaur. 145 foot uh, apatosaurus is walking by, and God's like, look at that, Job. He's the chief of my ways. I made that. How cool is that? By the way, bye-bye uh, hippo, we'll get rid of the hippo now. Uh, the, there's evidence that dinosaurs survived the flood and continued to live alongside man. There's depictions like that on a rock cave there where you see a drawing of a long neck, long tail uh, dinosaur and a man next to it. There's a picture of a stegosaurus type dinosaur uh, on, on a temple in Cambodia. That, that shows that if they made it on the post-flood world, they got on the ark. Now, of course, Noah's smart enough, he's 600 years old, he's wise enough to bring a baby on board. <laughs> He didn't say, beep, 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 come on, back it up, back, beep, beep. He wasn't trying to get 145 foot of Patasaurus on the ark. Uh, what about these guys right here, though? Ah, that's a different story, I believe. Well, I don't believe that, that God created that. I think that that was part of the genetic manipulation that we see in Genesis 6, 12, and 13. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. That looks like a violent creature to me. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. We see in the extra-biblical text in 1 Enoch 7, 5, and they, the Nephilim, began to sin against birds, beasts, reptiles, and fish. We see also in Jubilees 5, 2b, men and cattle and beasts and birds and everything that walked on the earth were all corrupted in their ways and in their orders, and they began to devour each other. There's a devourer for you, <laughs> right? Uh, I think that, let me just back up to that. 
I think that these texts are telling us exactly where that variety of dinosaur that didn't, I don't believe, make it through the flood. I think that the man started tinkering with the existing lizards and created things like that. That's my take on that. Now, who made it and who didn't? We see in Genesis 6.20, of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. What repetitive phrase do you see there? Yeah, I put it in yellow. It helps you out. Open book test, right? Genesis 7, 13 and 14. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. What repetitive phrase do you see there? Where is it curiously missing, though? With the people. It just says they. It doesn't say they after their kind, but it says the various animals after their kind. And I believe the reason it doesn't say that is because I think the suspicious women right there, or the wives of the three sons, have to fall in the category of Genesis 6.12. Remember, 18 comes after 12? Yeah, that's what I think is going on there. Now, we see after the flood, seven, or during the flood, I should say, Genesis 7, 20 through 22. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, all that was in the dry land died. What curious phrase is missing? After their kind. So who were destroyed? The ones that were corrupted. What was preserved? The ones after their kind, with the exception of three individuals, they, <laughs> that we saw previously. And I believe God had a purpose for that as we move forward. Essentially, I believe that Corrupting the Image, this is Doug Hamp's book, Corrupting the Image, and Tom and Nita Horn's book, Forbidden Gates. I had them both sitting on my table in my home office in this order. And I happened to look at it, the way they were arranged, I thought, huh, I wonder if that's the formula. What if corrupting the image that God originally created leads to opening forbidden gates that brings about the creation of Nephilim? And so I kind of started proceeding from that idea and start looking at mainstream news reports and thinking, man, we're messing with stuff we shouldn't be messing with. All the stuff that's taking place in laboratories around the world right now. This is a movie I do not recommend you see. It's called Splice, but it depicts that. They create an animal-human hybrid that starts off very ugly in the beginning, starts to morph in its growth and development to look like a baby, a toddler, you know, an adolescent. They try to make her look sexy as a woman. But at the end of the movie, this same creature morphs from this female into a fallen angel male-looking creature at the end of the movie. And they actually said, this creature is named Dren in the movie, that one of their goals for Dren was to create a genetically engineered angel. Again, Hollywood's getting it. I believe that's exactly what was going on in the pre-flood world. And so we will transition from that into a discussion on the post-flood return of the Nephilim. We see in Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 20, a whole bunch of names that are very interesting. Remember I referenced that book, uh, Dictionary of Scripture Proper Names, and how you find some very interesting stuff stuff there? Well, here's one such example. These are all of the names listed in Genesis chapter 6, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 20. And you see right beside each name, I'm not going to go through them all because I'm going to read them together in a sentence in a second here, but you see each name with the, the meaning uh, of each one of these Hebrew names side by side, okay? Now, if you put these all together and string them together in a paragraph in the exact order that you see here given to you in Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 20, this is the paragraph you end up with. He raged, a black terror, double straight afflicted trafficker, black terror, drink thou anguish, compass the chamber, thunder, compass the smiting, he who is coming, their love, we shall rebel. A double straight fire branch, revealing affliction of water, blades opening the moistened morsel, forgiven ones bowing to spy, a trafficker hunting terrors, trodden down sayers, the strangers draw near, showers of life, gnawing like thorns, they shall break loose, double woolen enclosures of wrath. That's a pretty interesting family tree you got going on there. Now, let me ask you, we already discussed how people name their children for a reason, you know, like we talked about Esau and Jacob and a bunch of, there's lots of other examples in Scripture. So I ask you, what prompts a parent to look down at their newborn child and say, hey, uh, honey, what do you think about enclosure of wrath? What do you think? Or terror. <laughs> Clearly, something was going on with these kids. 
And these are all the ites that the Israelites were told to utterly destroy all throughout the Old Testament. Okay, something clearly is going on with this generation. Uh, now, this is a chart that I created to show the post-flood return of the Nephilims in a graphical format. Uh, and you see that Ham begat Canaan, who begat Amorius, who, who was the father of the Amorites. You get a lot of Amorite giants in the Bible. And we talked about in the previous session that Amos 2.9 says the Amorites got as tall as cedar trees. One of the Amorites was an individual named Arba who had a son named Anak who had the Anakim that the Israelite spies ran into uh, when they went into the land after the Exodus. Right? So you've got a direct line of giants going directly back to the ark with no mention of any angels mating with anybody in the picture. It all goes back to the people in Genesis chapter 10 in the table of nations. And I showed you last night, it's just not just in Ham's generation, but you also see it in uh, Japheth as well with Gog and Magog. Right? showed you that in the previous session. Now, just to give you an idea of scale, when they went into the land and they felt like grasshoppers by comparison, this is what they were up against. All right, just imagine that in battle. <laughs> and in the movie Wrath of the Titans, I was going to play a clip, but it, just, it's, it was just fluff, you know, uh, taking up time. But if you watch the uh, movie Wrath of the Titans, there's a scene where Perseus goes up against a guy about this big. He goes up against a cyclops about that size. So it shows actually what combat with a giant like that might have looked like in those days. I like what Caleb said here. This kind of cracked me up. Caleb quiets the people. and He says, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. <laughs> That's some faith right there. And I don't have time to get into it here, but, and I did in my book. I detailed it in my book. You remember when the spies were chosen to go into the land? They, they give you three names, the name of the tribe, that the spy is from, the name of the father of the spy, and the name of the spy. And so you got that for all 12 tribes. So there's three, so it's 36 names. And when you put it all together, it spells, a pretty, spells out a pretty amazing par uh, set of paragraphs that I have to wonder if Caleb didn't figure that out. Because, I mean, look, I'll be honest with you. If I'm a six-foot guy seeing that, I'm going to, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to kind of like giving a bad report too, probably. You know, I'll just be honest with you. But Caleb's like, no, let's go. What are we waiting for? We can do this. And I, I believe that when, he, when Caleb looked at the lineup of guys that were around him, he probably said to himself, well, that guy's name means that. That guy means name, his name means this. This guy, wow, God's in this. He's doing something. I, again, I don't have time to go through it all right now, but it's fascinating because the order of the names that you're given and, the, and the, what it spells out is, is extraordinary. God was in this. He was telling them, you guys can do this. That's why God got so mad. It made them wander around the wilderness when they wouldn't, when, wouldn't go in there. He was going to give these giants into their hands. No problem. Now, I told you in the mythology talk about the early civilization, most scholars believe in the 31, 32, second, 32nd uh, century B.C. is about the time frame when a lot of the megalithic structures start showing up around the world. Right? Uh, Baalbek is one such, such a structure. The history of Baalbek reaches back approximately 5,000 years. Excavations beneath the great court of the Temple of Jupiter have uncovered traces of settlements dating to the Middle Bronze Age, 1900 to 1600 BC, built on top of an older level of human habitation dating to the early Bronze Age, 2900 to 2300 BC, which makes it roughly contemporary with the Tower of Babel. So that structure was built about the same time the Tower of Babel was built. And as I continued to dig into that a little deeper, I found this interesting quote from a book called The History of Baalbek by Michael Alouf, page 41. He says, After the flood, when Nimrod reigned over Lebanon, he sent giants to rebuild the fortress of Baalbek, which was so named in honor of Baal, the god of the Moabites and worshippers of the sun. So remember I told you that Nimrod was a giant? And I, there's reason to believe that he became not just a giant himself, but a subduer of giants. He became a leader. He was the global empire, you know, ruler of the time. Uh, well, so he goes back to Baalbek, leads a bunch of giants there to build the for fortress of Baalbek. And you see, this is one of the largest megalithic stones on the planet. You see that guy standing on the end of it? That guy's probably about six feet tall. Gives you a, a scale for how big that stone is. Well, you know, archaeologists and scientists and architects and different people look at that and they have no clue. How in the world did ancient people quarry that rock, cut it? move it. Nobody can figure that out. There's no, even with our best equipment today, we couldn't do it. And so what's their solution? Well, ancient aliens must have did it. You know, Scotty, get the tractor beam. Let's levitate the, you know, that's what they think. But I said, well, what if we let the scriptures tell us what happened? Remember Amos 2.9? There was what, tall as cedar trees? And it also said strong as the oaks. 
So what if we scaled, oh, I don't know, Arnold Schwarzenegger up to 36 feet? Size of a cedar tree, strong as the oaks. Put a couple guys like that on either side, and it starts to make sense how those big stones were quarried, cut, and moved. Right? Hey, Arnold, stop flexing for the camera. Come over here. Give me a hand. <laughs> right? The scriptures are telling us what happened, I believe, how, that's, how those megalithic structures were created. Now, I, I've been mentioning Numbers 13.33. Numbers 13.33 says, And there, were, there we saw the giants, the Nephilim in Hebrew, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, or the Nephilim. We were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So the question needs to be asked, were the giants sterile? Now, many teachers who study this subject will tell you the giants were sterile, the Nephilim were sterile. But I'm like, guys, it just told you right here that these are the sons <laughs> of Anak, who was a son of Arba, who was an Amorite, son of Amorius, son of Canaan, son of Ham, who stepped off the ark. No, the giants were not sterile. There are a number of places where we see that, that like, they were, they were sons of the giant in Gath. We were talking about Goliath and, and the uh, other giants that David and his mighty men took out, right? No, the giants are absolutely not sterile. These are Nephilim that came from Nephilim, giants that came from giants. We see another example I just mentioned in 2 Samuel 21, 22. These four were born to the giant in Gath. No, they are not sterile, clearly. Now, let's talk about what I call suspicious women and the rise of the X-Men. I just revealed to you that the giants clearly were not sterile from Scripture. So what about female? Were there, were there female Nephilim? Now, my theory is that the three women that got on the ark had issues, that they had to have fallen into the category of Genesis 6:12. All flesh had become corrupted. We all agree that 18 comes after 12, right? First mention of the wives is in verse 18, after all flesh had become corrupted. So my thesis says that, yes, I believe that they, had, they were female corrupted. Uh, they had genetics that were corrupted. Okay, which would make them female Nephilim. Now, the Bible seems to testify that there were Nephilim that were female as well. Now, a lot of teachers will, will disagree with me. That's fine, but let's look at Deuteronomy 3, 5 and 6. And these cities were fenced with high walls, gates and bars, beside unwalled towns, a great many. And we utterly destroyed them, as we did unto Sihon, king of Heshbon, who was an Amorite king, utterly destroying the men, women, and children of every city. Now, we talked about this in a previous session. Either God is prejudiced and into random acts of genocide, or there's a reason why he's saying to do this, kill even the women and the children. I suspect that there were, because they were female Nephilim, just like the male Nephilim that were having to be wiped out everywhere. And if male Nephilim are with female Nephilim and they're producing children, you've got to wipe the kids out too. All of a sudden it starts making sense why God is doing all of that, those acts in the Old Testament. It's an act of love and mercy to protect the good people that he created that would lead to us. <laughs> exactly. Wiping these people out. Deuteronomy 7, 1, 2, and 3. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and, hast, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Parasites, <laughs> Parasites, Parasites, <laughs> who were probably Parasites, Parasites, and the Hivites, uh, and the Jebusites, these are the ites that we saw in Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 20. Seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. I mean, that's a strong phrase right there. It's saying, like, utterly wipe these guys out. Make no trace of these guys left behind after that. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor shew mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. So don't go mixing with them. How many times did God tell Abraham, don't go marrying the Canaanites? Isaac, don't go marrying the Canaanites. Jacob, don't go marrying the Canaanites. Where did Yeshua come from? Which tribe? Judah. Judah. What's the only guy that married a Canaanite? Judah. I believe that my wife calls it Operation, Operation Leverage. Uh, because Judah, the one guy that he, through whom the Messiah is going to come, of all the tribes of Judah, of all the tribes of Jacob that came from Abraham, you know, everybody's told, don't marry a Canaanite, don't marry a Canaanite, don't marry a Canaanite. What does Judah, Judah do? He goes and marries a Canaanite. Then you got the whole deal with the three sons, uh, you know, and the sin of Onan and all that. It, those were Canaanite Nephilim mating with a pure blood guy, Judah. So what was the Operation Leverage? Well, remember what happened with Tamar? She dressed herself up as a prostitute and ended up having sex with him and produced Perez and everything, and that, that's the lineage that leads to Yeshua. So it was leverage. What she did, she was a pureblood marrying with him. So it's very interesting. Uh, I do give a lot more detail about that in my book. Neither shalt thou make marriage with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. 
There are other examples of, I believe, female Nephilim in your Bible. Diana of the Ephesians, for one, is a, is a goddess, Acts 19.35. Ashtoreth of the Zidonians, 1 Kings 11, 4 and 5. The Queen of Heaven, we talked about in some of the previous sessions there. Jeremiah 7.16-20. through 20. That's your Isis, that's Ishtar, that's the Sirens, you know, these various characters that appear both in your Bible as well as in uh, other mythologies and things like that. Now, speaking of mythology, when we talk about the Titans, Josephus recognizes that the first generation Nephilim are the Titans. We talked about the first generation Nephilim that were wiped out in the first 500 years. Well, there were male and female paired up as you see here. There are male and female Titans. So clearly there were male and female Nephilim, both from the biblical text as well as in the mythologies. And then you got characters like these people right here. You got Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Now that's not just a cool hat she's got on right there. She's covering up one heck of a dome of a head. I mean, she's got a big old head. How did it get like that? She had to have inherited those, those traits somewhere. Now, I'm going to get to that in a second. I believe that perhaps that's what the women that got on the ark may have looked like. They were genetically modified probably to have increased intellectual capacities. I mean, some of these skulls, and I'm going to talk about some of these Nephilim skulls, they have anywhere from 25 to 40% more brain capacity than you and I. So what, what were they capable of doing, you know, with that much more brain? Uh, we see depictions like Akhenaten and Nefertiti there with their children. In fact, their kids also had uh, their cone heads. <laughs> now, a lot of people would say, well, that's just, you know, headboarding, where they put boards on babies' heads, and when the baby's head is still forming and it's stretching the skull out. Well, first of all, yes, putting boards on babies' head will reshape their skull into weird shapes but it's not going to give them 40% more brain capacity. It's not going to change the suture pattern. There's a lot of problems with that theory. Yes, there are people out there doing that, but the reason they're doing it is they're emulating something that was real. They saw people that were really like that, and they're usually in positions of royalty, just like we saw with Akhenaten and Nefertiti. So they were wanting to emulate that. That's why people started, you know, what possesses somebody to say, honey, when our baby's born, I tell you what, what if, what if we stretch its skull out? Like, like, let's like put boards on the kid's head. What do you think? Why do people come up with these things? There's a reason why they think that way. They saw something and they were emulating it, right? Now, a friend of mine uh, that I hadn't talked to in like five years was, uh, he, he used to live here in Texas, um, Jeff Randall. He moved up to New York. I hadn't talked to him in like five years. And he does a Google search. He was searching for something about Nephilim and <coughs> saw my stuff like all over the internet. You do some Googles, you'll see you know, videos and all kinds of stuff I got out on the internet, blogs and whatnot. And he's like, wow, I didn't know Rob was into that. So he called me up and he says, hey, when did you, I didn't know you were into the Nephilim stuff. When did you get into that? I said, well, I've kind of always been into it, but it really just recently, you know, started really putting stuff out about it. He says, well, I'll tell you what, we got to meet. I'm coming back to Texas. Um, I'm in New York now, and uh, I know we haven't seen each other in a while, but let me take you out to lunch. I said, sure. So we go out to lunch, and he gives me this. <laughs> he says, maybe this will help you with your research. I'm like, dude, yeah. This is a female Nephilim skull, I believe. This is actually a replica. It's, it's plastic. It's not the real deal. But he knows a, a woman who had access to the actual skulls in Peru that w made a really good cast of this thing. And, uh, and gave it to me. Now, what's really interesting, first of all, the shape of the skull, and I'll show you a picture in a minute that shows a normal uh, person's skull superimposed over it, so you see the, how much more brain capacity this has. They do tests where they pour, like, salt or sand or something inside to see what the cranial capacity is, how much it is, like, in cc's compared to a normal human skull. And I forgot what this one was. It was anywhere somewhere between 20 and 40 percent more uh, than a regular skull. But you can't see it from the back there, probably, but we have a frontal lobe right? And two parietal and occipital plate. Well, this, this suture pattern is completely different. This has one going this way and then another one going back this way and some weird holes up here and, and no uh, suture pattern right here like you and I have. Putting boards on somebody's head is not going to change the suture pattern. This person was born this way and this person inherited those genetic traits somehow. So my speculation is that the women who got in the ark may have looked like that. They had to get the traits somehow. Right uh, now, here's the difference between a female and a male. These are some of the male skulls that are a lot more robust, you know, larger jaws and sometimes bigger heads and jaw bones and whatnot. Much more robust. Then uh, news reports started coming out. This was just December of this past year, where they found a bunch of these skulls in uh, Mexico. They said this poor person unfortunately suffered suffered from cranial deformation. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, a little more than that, buddy. 
Uh, but they also found some very interesting things. There's a book by uh, David Hatcher Childress and Brian Forrester called The Enigma of Cranial Deformation. And in that book, they give examples of different cases such as this one right here. Uh, here's a quote from their book. It says, two, two crania, both of children scarcely a year old, had in all respects the same form as those of adults. The same formation of the head presents itself in children yet unborn. And of this truth, we have had convincing proof inside of a fetus enclosed in the womb of a mummy of a pregnant woman. So that's not headboarding. That's a seven-month-old fetus that was found inside the remains of a mummified pregnant woman. And this thing looks like alien. Okay? This creature was born or is going to be born that way. People were born that way. Uh, this is the first what I call the, the home alone baby. Oh, no! <laughs> I've got a cone head! <laughs> I mean, look at the size of that kid's head compared to his body. Big, large, very unusual. Now, again, this is what I think possibly the wives of Noah's three sons may have looked like. And you see on the left, there is a, you can see like the superimposed image of a normal person's skull over it. So you can see clearly the difference uh, both in shape as well as cr uh, brain capacity. And then they did some forensics on it and started building it up with clay and stuff to determine what this person may have physically looked like. She may have looked something like that, possibly. And per perhaps that doesn't suit your fancy, so well, maybe she looks something like this. Okay? We're still emulating. It's still being em that's still emulation. All right? Now, minus the increased cranial capacity and uh, brain capacity, <laughs> they may have looked something like that. You know? Uh, what about, let's talk about the X-Men, right? They are mutants, right? They all have different abilities, and some of them are blended with, you know, different creatures and whatnot, things like that. I found it really interesting that uh, this particular character in the movies, the X-Men, uh, this woman actually has six toes. <laughs> So, uh, hmm, <laughs> kind of interesting. Just one of those little useless pieces of trivia bouncing around in my head. <coughs> now, some people think, well, that's absurd, Rob. Why would God allow Nephilim onto the ark? And I said, well, let's back up a minute and address the alternative, because the alternative is even worse. You say it's absurd for me to suggest that God allowed Nephilim women onto the ark. But I say it's more absurd to allow angels to just keep coming back and mate with women over and over again. I've already addressed the root cause. That deal was done with, according to the book of Enoch, 1 uh, Enoch chapter 10, verses 10 through 12. Those angels were judged, bound, and buried. The judgment was so severe, no other angels are recorded as ever mating with women again, in the Bible or in any extra-biblical text either. So you guys are arguing from a position of textual silence. There's no, nothing to support what you're saying. Um, but if... if Angels mate with women, produce Nephilim. God wipes the whole world. What was it, just like a halftime show? Hey, angels, take a seat for a minute. I'm going to clean off the playing field. Okay, now it's clean. Come on back. Pick up where you left off. That's even more absurd than what I'm suggesting. I'm saying, no, some genetic codes made it through in probably recessive genes on, onto the ark with three women. And if that theory is true, and it's just a theory, but looking at Genesis 10, 6 through 20, there's no mention of angels anywhere in the picture. We know that Shem, Ham, and Japheth were all pure. So how do we get all these ites that are all corrupted with no mention of angels anywhere? The only solution left to us is that it had to be the women, in my opinion, that got on the ark. But there's a good, good thing here. Because if that's true, that was actually God's divine sovereign wisdom in allowing that to happen. Because women have two X chromosomes and men have an X and a Y chromosome. When we have children, the, the husband contributes a Y and the woman contributes one of her X's, you end up with a son, right? If the man contributes his X and she contributes one of her X's, you get a daughter. Well, you see what happens here. If you've got a completely normal male like Shem, Ham, and Japheth, completely normal, and let's say a 50-50 hybrid female with one tainted X and one good X, you have a 50-50 chance that you're going to produce completely normal children. I believe this, this is not a race issue. This is an obedience issue. This is an obedience issue. I'm convinced of that. Uh, so clearly when you look at Shem's generation, or Shem's offspring, it must have fallen in favor of the 50% normal because all of his kids are 100% normal. When you look at Japheth, you get a little bit of a mixture. He's got giants in his stuff. So you got some in there and you got you know, good ones. Same thing with Ham. Not all of his kids were bad either. Mainly Canaan. Who was cursed, Ham or Canaan? Canaan. Right. Ham was not cursed. Canaan was cursed. Canaan has the giants. 
Now, there's one giant in Mitzram, but most of the rest of his kids are normal. There's no giants in Put's lineage, and in Cush's lineage, his kids are all good too, except for Nimrod, but he did something to himself to make himself become a giant. He, 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 he changed himself. He wasn't born that way. All right? So you see how the percentages worked, played out. And this is called a Punnett square in, in biology, <laughs> putting it together. Now, if you believe in multiple incursions, you've got a really big problem because this is what you end up with. If you've got a fallen angel inserting both bad Y and X chromosomes into the human genome, you've got one big mess to deal with after that. So I would strongly contend that their, my opponent's theory is way more absurd than what I'm suggesting and way more detrimental to the human genome as well. Now, when it comes to giants, I'm looking for empirical evidence. How, can, how does this giantism work? I mean, how does it work? Do we have any examples? Well, yeah, actually we do. Have you ever heard of the Liger? Well, this is their website, LigerLiger.com. This is the front page. Notice on the bottom there, they named the, the, uh, the Ligers after the Nephilim. Hercules, Zeus, Sinbad, Vulcan. <laughs> Watch this video uh, concerning Ligers. This big guy is a Liger. Yes, a Liger. And trainer Doc Antle and his partner Rajani have the biggest one in the world. This is Hercules who is our Liger boy, 900 pounds and 12 feet tall. He's a gigantic kid because he's a Liger. Father lion, mother tiger makes him... Father is a lion, mother is a tiger. Makes him the Liger. Up, Hercules is skilled at, up, up. well, Herc. eating Herc. Put your leg up. about 100 Put your leg pounds up. of meat a day. Everything about him seems exaggerated. They seem to live longer, they eat more. We've never seen anything happen in the Ligers except bigger, stronger, faster. It's theorized that ligers are this enormous size because the inhibitor growth gene exists in the female lion and in the male tiger. So when you switch around and you get a male lion breeding with a female tiger, creating the liger, you get this gigantic size. Nothing tells it when to stop. In the wild, this enormous size wouldn't necessarily be of any advantage because it would require so much more food. Samson here can readily eat 25 pounds of food in a sitting, where an adult lion can subside on 7 to 10 pounds of food. That's solid empirical evidence of gigantism, how it works. Did you catch what they said? The growth inhibitor gene is in the female lion and in the male tiger. So when you mate a male lion with a female tiger, there's no gene to tell them when to stop growing. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as turning off a genetic code or removing it, and you end up with giants. And I think hybridization produces things like that, just as you see in this empirical, solid evidence right here with giants. So it's not as mystical as it might at first seem to you. Right? It, it makes sense, actually, how things like that can happen. There's a growth inhibitor gene in me that said Rob Skiba stopped growing at about 5 foot 10 and a half when he was 16 years old. You have one in you that told you when to stop growing at whatever age you were. Some of the giants in the Bible clearly, or all the giants in the Bible, clearly didn't have, either, either didn't have that gene or it was somehow turned off through some sort of hybridization process. See, it's not as mystical as you might think. Now, let's talk about post-flood chimeras. Uh, a blending of species and things like that. Uh, this image right here, a uh, black obelisk of Shalmaneser III, is an individual mentioned in 2 Kings 17.3. On this black obelisk of Shalmaneser III, you see an elephant. It's a full-grown elephant. You can tell by the length and size of its tusk. Okay, and then right behind the elephant, you have a lion man. A man has a lion body with, like, human hands and a human head. And he's on a leash. And if that's a full-grown elephant, the dude walking as Lion Man <laughs> is pretty huge because I don't know if you can see it, but the, the image cuts off at the guy's shoulders, which is about the same height as the top of the elephant. <laughs> so there's a giant walking his little, cute little pet Lion Man. <laughs> and we have mention of Lion Men actually in 2 Samuel 23.20, the Lion Men of Moab. Lion Men of Moab, right there in your Bible. The Hittites, their name means the terrors, uh, we're fond of putting depictions like this in stone. This is another variety of lion man. who has It's a lion with wings, has a lion head and a human head with a snake tail. They have other depictions like this one right here that shows two satyrs 
half man, half goat in the middle with a different variety of lion man, human body with a lion or, or cat head. Okay, so, but when you're seeing images like this, what's really interesting to me is when you look through the scriptures and you see things like uh, Abraham and his wife, Sarah. When Sarah died, she, Abraham was negotiating for a burial plot for his wife. And it says in multiple places in Genesis that he negotiated with an individual named Ephron of the Hittites. Well, the Hittites means terrors. They're making depictions like this in stone all over the place showing Chimera. And Ephron's name means fawn-like. So it appears to be saying in the Hebrew that Abraham negotiated with a satyr for a burial plot for his wife amongst the Hittites who were the terrors. Wild stuff in your Bible. Uh, it's very interesting. That's what, I, what, what these talks have done for us as we've gone around and, and told these talks. It's gotten people excited to go back into their Bible again because it is full of wild stuff. It's extremely interesting, and that's my hope here today is that you will get just as excited to go dive in as well. And I give you a, kind of a pathway to do that in the book. It's showing you a bunch of different examples of things. But there are other examples of uh, different varieties of lion creatures that are hybrids, like the Persian Greek griffin right there on the left, the charioteer of Delphi on the right. It's like the sphinx. And then, of course, you've got the, the famous centaurs and things like that in the Greek mythology. So they're all over the place. All right. Oh, and this is the most, uh, one of the most famous uh, sculptures of the ancient world. It's known as the Chimera of Arezzo. It's a famous uh, sculpture of the of Roman era right there. Now, let's talk about, let's, we're going to transition now into the last days and talk about in, in 2045 and all that good stuff. Last days return of the Nephilim. Now, I first need to differentiate between the days of Jared and the days of Noah. What did Jesus say the last days would be like? The days of who? Noah. Days of Noah, not Jared. Okay. The days of Jared were marked by the mating of angels and humans. That happened in his day. However, it was in the days of Noah that the creation of animal-human hybrids brought about the corrupting of all flesh we read about in Genesis 6.12, which ultimately led to God's judgment with the flood. So if I was to take Jesus' words literally in Matthew 24.37, as it was in the days of Noah, all I have to do is turn on the evening news. There, you're seeing the regular blending of animals and humans. You're not seeing reports of angels mating with humans as it was in the days of Jared. But you are seeing the creation and the corruption of all flesh, aren't you? On a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. So that brings us to a discussion of transhumanism, transhumanism which I believe is a doctrine of devils. We see in Genesis 3, 4, and 5, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. We covered this in the previous session, but I want to drive the point home here. Uh, promises of the serpent. There are three. Immortality, eyes being open, having greater wisdom and understanding, and you shall be as gods. Remember what I said in the previous session? They already had all three. They were already immortal. Death came after they took a bite. The uh, eyes open, they walk with God. They didn't need any greater wisdom and understanding. All they had to do was ask the Creator who hung out with them in the cool of the day. Be like God. They were made in the image and likeness of God already. So the devil tricked them into giving up three things they already had, and man has been trying to get those things back ever since, many times apart from God. Remember I mentioned a guy by the name of Nick Bostrom. Keep these three promises in mind as you hear this clip. You heard it yesterday, but I'm just going to take a snippet from what you, one of the clips you saw in the other session. Three promises, immortality, greater wisdom and understanding, and ye shall be as gods. Out of the mouth of Professor Nick Bostrom. What I'm really interested in is to try to understand the bigger picture for humanity, our place in the world and what might lie in store for our species in the future, particularly the way we might use technologies to enhance ourselves or to um, go beyond what we currently think of as our human nature, whether it might be by radically extending the human lifespan through um, solving the problem of aging or increasing our intellectual capacities, improving our memory, or taking control of our own emotional states. Um, I think that we are right now in a transitional phase um, where before the end of this century we will either have gone extinct or we will have most likely taken the step to become what you might call transhumans or posthumans or just very um, enhanced humans that have reached their full potential. The three promises of Lucifer in the same order. from one of the leading spokespersons of transhumanism. Wow. 
I mean, what do you do with that? This is a chart I showed you in one of the previous sessions, what, what their ambition is. The lower right corner there, it shows what senses are available to humans, what we can see, hear, taste, touch, smell. If we, animals have different senses than we do, so that's the, the longer gray one on the bottom there. And he says, well, if we blend humans together with animals, we may be able to get enhanced abilities and new senses. So we'll have, you know, that larger circle there, what's accessible to transhumans. And if we keep messing with the genome, we're going to get better at it. And then this big circle here, what's, that's what's going to be available to us as post-humans. We will be like the gods. That's what's happening today, right now in universities around the world. Plans to allow scientists to create embryos that are part human and part animal are set for approval by the official regulator in Britain. These hybrid embryos are seen by the country's leading scientists as a vital step in the search for cures for diseases such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. It's a highly controversial procedure and is banned in some European countries. Our medical correspondent Fergus Walsh has the story. This embryo is part mouse, part cow. In a few months, this Newcastle lab is hoping to create a human-cow hybrid. This is highly complex science, the creation of cytoplasmic hybrids, known as cybrid embryos. The starting point is a cow's egg, which is cut open by a laser. The DNA is sucked out. The next step is to take a human cell, perhaps from a patient with Parkinson's disease, and inject it into the egg. Now this is the crucial point at which an embryo is created because by using an electric shock the hybrid embryo starts growing. The cells subdividing. In reality it's smaller than a pinhead and when it's just six days old the embryo shell is broken open. Inside are stem cells, the body's master cells. The ultimate aim is to reprogram them into any tissue in the body. For example, nerve cells, heart cells, or brain cells. Scientists say this research is of profound importance and could lead to new treatments for a host of diseases, like diabetes and Alzheimer's. But all this is years away. The science is just beginning. Inside this barn is a herd of cows that evolution could never have produced. What a sight. Every animal here is a clone. They're all genetic copies of just two original cows created in the lab. They were created by genetic engineering in the hope of saving human life. Hey! <laughs> Antibodies are produced by our bodies to fight disease. They can destroy lethal infections like SARS and poisons like botulism. But no one has found a way to mass produce them until now. Dr. Robel's calves are worth up to half a million dollars each. They have human DNA inside them. Their future is to be milked for their blood. This is the world's first antibody extraction parlor. For two hours every week or so, these precious cows are connected to pumps that filter their blood and extract human antibodies. And the ultimate goal is to say take anthrax, yes. expose the cow to anthrax, in inject mm -hmm. it with anthrax, at which point it starts making lots of antibodies That's against correct. anthrax. Yes. And then you can collect those antibodies, purify them, and treat people who have been exposed to anthrax. Yes. But it's no easy job to get cows to produce human antibodies. You have to genetically modify the cow's immune system to make it at least partly human. Dr. Roval has had to copy two sets of genes out of our DNA, which he then combines into a package called a microchromosome. But to get that microchromosome into the cow, he's had to use one of the most complex cut and paste jobs I've ever heard of. Take the microchromosome and you transfer it from mouse cells to chicken cells. Okay, and this is a specific chicken cell line that allows you to cut and paste chromosomes. And the best way to carry this chromosome is actually in a hamster cell line. <laughs> so then it goes to a hamster cell line. We then transfer it to the cow cell line. So let me just get this straight. To make a human chromosome, you have to go through mice, chickens, hamsters, and then cows. And then finally cows, yes. Wow. Because each cell type has its own peculiar but specific quality that allows us to do a specific kind of manipulation. These cows take blood donation to a whole new level. 
Just 10 or 20 of them could supply the yearly worldwide demand for one of Dr. Robel's antibody therapies. And it's the kind of advance that only genetic engineering could have given us. But in order to really take advantage of the technology, we're going to have to embrace it. But in order to take advantage of this technology, we're going to have to embrace it. Moron. That's dangerous. Do you hear what they say? To get a human chromosome, we got to go through mice, hamsters, chickens, and cows. Well, to get a human, we got human chromosomes. What did Genesis 6.12 say, right? All flesh should become corrupted. You want a cow-human hybrid for you? It's called a minotaur. Right? We saw in Joshua 4.18 and Jubilee 7.24 how the corruption of all flesh took place by doing exactly what Dr. Robles and company are doing. Corrupting the human genome and that of all other creations as well. Again, I'm going to point to this. I believe that corrupting the image leads to opening forbidden gates that may bring about the creation of Nephilim, or in other words, that which has fallen from its original state that God created it to be. And it's dangerous. I found it really interesting that, you know, they're talking about antibodies and blood and all that stuff. Well, I did a little search on Bible.cc for a keyword search on blood, and it showed that there's 435 occurrences of that word in the Bible. 435 times the word blood appears in the Bible. Perhaps not coincidentally, it's the same exact number as nephal, the root word from Nephilim, is also used 435 times in the Bible. So how interesting that you have the word nephal, which means to fall among other things, but the antidote to that blood is mentioned the same amount of times. Coincidence, right? <laughs> I think coincidence is just God being anonymous. Leviticus 17.11 says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. We know that except for the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, right? We know that. Well, I'll tell you a little something here. Um, I've been having some physical issues in the last uh, year and a half or so. Um, uh, like, I'm fine like this, everything's okay, everything's good, but if I apply any pressure to my muscles, this is what happens. I'm not, I'm hardly pressing at all here, all right? Like, and that's everywhere. It's driving me crazy. So, I mean, I'm not going to the doctor. I am not getting mice, hamster, chickens, you know. Do you hear what they say? Oh, it's a cure for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, all this stuff that they create with the GMO food we're eating. Um, I'm not going there. Uh, it's too dangerous to go there. So I'm looking for, first of all, you know, divine healing, because I, I believe in it. Uh, but secondly, I'm looking for natural ways of taking care of it. Uh, so I went to a natural Christian homeopathic guy here in Plano, and he did what's called a microscopy, where they take a little sample of blood from your pinky, and they look under it under a microscope. Uh, and so he took a sample of my blood, and drop of blood on the sample. He said, now just let it continue to ooze out. Don't touch it or don't press it. Just let it naturally ooze out. Uh, and he waited a few seconds. And then he took another glass slide and smudged it once, waited a few seconds, smudged it twice, and a third time. And he put it aside. I said, what's that for? He said, well, the life is in the blood, right? I said, yeah, the scripture tells us that. He said, well, each one of those smudges is going to tell us it's going to represent a third, of, different third of your life. The early third of your life, the middle third of your life, and your current third of your life. And I said, I'm like, okay. <laughs> so he put that aside and then uh, showed me the microscope of the live blood sample, the big drop there, and I'll show you the horror show that we saw in a minute uh, there. After we dealt with that, we came back to the slides that had now dried. And so all the, all the blood had dried. There was no moving cells and everything like that. And it had a lot of interesting pictures in it, one of them being this right here. He, he's scrolling through, looking at various things, making notes, and he, he comes across this. He says, he turns to me and says, do you ever break or dislocate your collarbone? I said, yeah, when I was like nine years old. He said, well, that's it right there. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? And then he points to a skeleton. He's got a you know, plastic skeleton in the corner, and he pointed to the clavicle, which looks remarkably like that. He said, that, he says, your blood is like, a, like carbon paper. That's the imprint of that injury. And this guy starts reading my mail from my blood. 
Like, I didn't say anything to him. He's asking me, he, he looks at someplace else, saw some other weird anomaly. He said, you had respiratory problems, too, in the first 30 of your lives, didn't you? I said, yeah, I had asthma until I was 12. Well, that's it right there. I mean, he's like reading my mail from my blood. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And then he goes to the second third of my life, and it looked good. It looked, it looked healthy. I was healthy and strong, and everything there was good. It gets to the last third of my life, it showed the pathology of the stuff that I'm dealing with. And so I'm like, Doc, you're freaking me out, man, because <laughs> you're actually proving a lot of the things in my own research. He said, what's your research? I said, well, I'm researching the Nephilim and stuff like that and genetics and my theory that it passed through on the ark with the three wives. And he's like, he starts freaking out because his wife operates in the prophetic and God had been told, telling her for weeks that she needed to understand Genesis 6 and the Nephilim. I'm like, well, Doc, you're in luck because I got a car full of DVDs and books. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, he really, really helped me out. That was totally a God thing. But when we looked at the live sample, this is, <laughs> this is what we saw. You know, it's supposed to be moving. Mine were all in big traffic jams, slammed together, deformed, and looking weird with things like in the top right corner, that's a parasite. And there's uh, the, the one in the second, one on the, on, in the middle there on the left, that's a cell-eating amoeba. And all those black dots are cells that it ate. And you could actually watch it, like, pulling cells in and eating them. Uh, just all kinds of stuff. And then the lower left right there, I had 25% cancer cells. Uh, just in all of that out of my pinky. I'm thinking, that came out of my pinky? <laughs> What's going on in the rest of my body? I mean, like, that's a horror show, man. I was, like, really depressed leaving there. I'm like, why am I still alive? How, how? You know, I had, there was fungus, parasite, bacteria, all kinds of stuff, 25% cancer. And we did uh, seven weeks of treatment, uh, 14 treatments of Rife treatment, which is different frequencies and ozone therapy and stuff. Cleaned out all the cancer. The cancer was gone. All the parasites were gone. The only thing that remained was uh, some bacteria that we, started, we still need to work out. Um, but most of that stuff was cleaned out, and the cells were moving, and they were all round after 14 treatments. I'm like, whoa, dude. So we're still trying to figure out what the, what the shaky thing's all about, but... I don't know, it makes you think. I mean, you start looking at things like parasites, you start thinking about host manipulation. There's some interesting videos I'm going to show you uh, in that regard. Ants are a part of the most disciplined, dedicated social system on Earth. Until, that is, they become slaves to behavior-controlling parasites. Suddenly, these rogue ants no longer serve the colony. They're taking their orders from the parasite. Okay, let's back up. Now, how did this happen? It all begins when the ants in any town USA consume the slime of a passing snail. They divide it up and take it back to the colony. This is a blunder of epic proportions. Turns out, the slime is loaded with eggs of a body snatcher called the liver fluke, a type of flatworm. The liver fluke burrows into a part of the ant's brain, and for unknown reasons, it's almost like the fluke enslaves the ants and orders them to carry it to their next hosts. Any grazing mammal host with a nice warm liver will do, but in this case, a cow appears. The liver fluke worms can switch the ant's behavior on and off causing the infected ants to place themselves in easy-to-eat positions at dusk when mammals are feeding. No cows in sight, ants act normal. Cows appear, ants are in essence ordered to take their positions in purple flowers and latch on. The cows ingest the vegetation, the ants, and the fluke larvae inside the ants all in one bite. Once inside the cow, the worms burrow out of the stomach and into the liver where they develop into adults and dine on liver tissue. They lay eggs that are excreted from the liver into the bile duct and then defecated by the cows. They don't kill the cows, but the cows become weak and emaciated, devastating herds. And all because of parasitic mind control. Did you catch that? This microscopic parasite controls the brain of an ant that normally gets around doing its thing just fine, but as soon as a mammal walks by, they, they all run up to get eaten because that parasite wants to get into the liver of a mammal. All right, and I, th there's a much longer version of this video that I have that shows similar things happen to humans. You ever wonder why you crave sugar at night? 
Like before you go to bed, you want that snack? Because that's when parasites eat. That's controlling you. When you're sitting there and it's like 9, 10 o'clock in your night and you say, man, I need a cookie. You're like You get up and you go eat some junk food. You are being mind controlled by a parasite. All right, that's why. You start taking things like Pararid, there's various natural resources you can take to get rid of them. All of a sudden you stop craving it at night because you, you lose them. It's amazing. Parasitic mind control. Now keep that in mind when we start transitioning into the mark of the beast talk. Okay? Revelation 13, 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand. I think I put that there twice, didn't I? <laughs> Here is, just make sure you got that. <laughs> Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6, 666. And we covered that uh, at some length in the previous sessions with regard to Nimrod. Um, and all of the various ways he's known by 666. Revelation 9, 5. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days men shall seek death, and death shall, shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Everybody talks about buying and selling. The mark of the beast, you're not going to be able to buy and sell. Well, that's true, but what about this part? where people are begging for death, but death flees from them. They have essentially purchased a counterfeit immortality apart from Christ. That is why they are cast alive into the lake of fire. They have genetically modified themselves such that they are no longer redeemable after that, and the only solution is to take them alive and put them in the lake of fire. Okay, everybody talks about the buying and selling, but they're missing a big part of the component right here. Revelation 19:20 and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him that which uh, with which he had deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image those both were cast alive into the lake burning with brimstone Now back in the 90s in 80s and whatnot and barcodes you know everybody was on the barcode kick I was too preaching that's, that's the mark of the beast the barcode you know, because you got the two long skinny lines, there is the six in the barcode. And you notice on the barcode, it has two long skinny lines of both ends and one set in the middle. So everybody's like, see, 666 six, six with an identifier in the middle, it's the mark of the beast, the barcode! Right? Then later, everybody started talking in the more recent times about the microchip. And now everybody thinks it's the microchip. Well, it may be a combination of all of those things, but I really think it's in here. And it's in the syringe. I think it's, we're, we're dealing with something that has to do at, a, at, the, at the genetic level with DNA. And my personal opinion is how do we, what, was, what purchased our salvation? The blood of Yeshua. Doesn't it make sense that the counterfeit of that would be perhaps the blood of the Antichrist? If we have our salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ, it makes sense that he's going to offer a counterfeit with his blood. Right? Now, if my theory is true concerning Nimrod, He's a 5,000-year-old dead guy that's resurrected. He's Frankenstein. Taking some of his blood and putting it in you, not a good idea. How could that happen? Well, Dr. Thomas Horn and others uh, speculate on this, how something like this might happen w with regard to a pandemic. Again, in true Hegelian style, you know, Hegelian dialectic is where you cause a problem which causes a reaction that you just so happen to have the solution for already ready to go, right? So, okay, it, it, just imagine this. They release, they, whoever they are, <laughs> they're responsible for everything, right? Release a really bad flu pandemic of some sort. Well, imagine this. If you don't get the shot that they've got all ready to go for you, no shot or cure means, well, you don't have a job. Somebody mentioned last night their job requires them to take the flu shot. If they don't get the flu shot, they lose their job. So we're already seeing kind of a microcosm of that happening right now, a test. Got to take the shot, you, know, you, can't, you can't be a teacher in school or you can't work at CVS or whatever, you got to take the shot. So they're already making it mandatory for some people. So we've got a little miniature test going on with that. If you don't take it, there's no cure, no job, you end up being quarantined. Oh, you, you, you don't, don't want to take the shot? You don't want to take what really I believe is going to be the mark of the beast? Well, fine, you're going to have to be quarantined, bring you over here. Well, that means you're not going to have any money, which means you won't be able to buy or sell. 
that seems to be a good explanation to me to explain why they can't buy or sell, but also explain why they beg for death, but death flees from them because they can't die, right? So that's if you don't take the shot, you end up with no job, quarantine, no flu, but, or, or no food, no buying or selling. Uh, but if you do take the shot, well, you have some interesting side effects. <laughs> it's like those commercials, you know, where you always see the drug that they're offering. Oh, side effects may include drowsiness, blah, 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 you know. <laughs> Take the shot. Side effects may include counterfeit immortality, not redeemable, and cast alive into the lake of fire. Ask your doctor if it's right for you. <laughs> All right, you know, I'm, I'm joking about it, but it's serious. That's some serious business right there. And there's going to come a time, especially if we're going through this thing, where some tough decisions may have to be made. When you're looking at your kid that's got this pandemic that they released, and they've got this cure over there, but you heard this stuff, and the Holy Spirit's telling you, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Don't inject your kid with the mark of the beast. We're going to have to like, work on that strong faith thing and believe in God and trusting in Him. You know, Seriously, I mean, it's just going to get pretty scary in the days ahead. This is, I believe, the formula for avoiding the corruption of our flesh. We see in John 14, 12, those of you who are out there who believe the, the gifts of the Spirit, the Spirit passed away with the apostles. That's the doctrine called cessation. That's a doctrine that I grew up in. I grew up in a denomination that taught cessation, that the gifts of the Spirit passed away with the apostles. I'm like, well, this is my trump card right here. John 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth in me, not just Peter, James, and John, the works that I do shall he do also. And even greater works, he says, then these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, we can argue about what the greater works are all day long. I don't know what the greater works are. Let's go back to the previous statement. We'll do the same works I've done. Oh, wait, you mean we're supposed to change water into wine and walk on water? Look, I didn't write it. That's what it says. This whole, you know, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, Paul says. So why are you trying to teach people that the gifts of the Spirit are passed away with the apostles? That's absurd. We're going to need this stuff. You know, seriously. Mark 16, 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. It doesn't say maybe, could be, maybe, possibly, hope so. It's pretty definitive words right there. James 5, 14, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of CVS, <laughs> Walgreens, Plano, Presbyterian Hospital, Baylor, right? No, it says elders of the church, huh, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith maybe possibly could heal somebody, is that what it says? Yeah. Shall save the sick, and the word there is the Greek word sozo. You use 118 times in your Bible. It's a word used for forgiveness, healing, deliverance, being set free, being made whole. The prayer of faith will heal the sick is what that's telling you. Well, I guess we've got to have prayers of faith, don't we? And the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have, uh, he have uh, committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. I believe this is the formula for, the corruption, uh, for avoiding the corruption of our flesh. It's right there in your scriptures. And, boy, we're going to have to get this. I'll tell you what, I'm walking it out right now, my own life. So I'm, I'm practicing what I preach here. Uh, there's some more corruption coming our way. Uh, we talked a lot about animals and stuff like that, but they're also talking about the cloning and merging with machines. The singularity uh, is at hand. The singularity is the technological creation of smarter than human intelligence. It's the Borg of Star Trek. Let's go ahead and blend humans with machines. And you got Time Magazine articles, uh, magazines coming out saying, human cloning, it's closer than you think. And this cover right here, it says, uh, Time Magazine, 2045, the year man becomes immortal. Hence the title of this presentation. What are they planning? What do they have in mind? What are they doing? Well, if you go to 2045.com, 2045.com, and read about the Strategic Social Initiative, the 2045 Strategic Social Initiative, uh, and see what they have planned. Better yet, I'll just play you a quick clip and let them tell you what they have planned. 2013 to 2014, new centers working on cybernetic technologies for the development of radical life extension rise. 
The race for immortality starts. 2015 to 2020, the avatar is created. A robotic human copy controlled by thought via brain-computer interface. It becomes as popular as a car. In Russia and in the world appear, in testing mode, several breakthrough projects. Android robots to replace people in manufacturing tasks. Android robot servants for every home. Thought-controlled avatars to provide telepresence in any place of the world and abolish the need for business trips. Flying cars. Thought-driven mobile communications built into the body or sprayed onto the skin. 2020 to 2025, an autonomous system providing life support for the brain and allowing it interaction with the environment is created. The brain is transplanted into an Avatar B. With Avatar B, man receives new, expanded life. 2025, the new generation of Avatars provides complete transmission of sensations from all five sensory robot organs to the operator. 2030 to 2035, ReBrain. The colossal project of brain reverse engineering is implemented. World science comes very close to understanding the principles of consciousness. 2035, the first successful attempt to transfer one's personality to an alternative carrier. The epoch of cybernetic immortality begins. 2040 to 2050, bodies made of nanorobots that can take any shape arise alongside hologram bodies. 2045 to 2050, drastic changes in social structure and in scientific and technological development. All the prerequisites for space expansion are established. For the man of the future, war and violence are unacceptable. The main priority of his development is spiritual self-improvement. A new era dawns. The era of neo-humanity. After all that, they decide to get spiritual. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable, but believe it, because it's happening. Coming soon to a reality near you. If you saw the timeline, very, very close. We, it's at hand. Uh, does the Bible prophesy about the return of the Nephilim? Yes, I believe it does. Absolutely. We see in Isaiah 13, 21. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full, shall be, okay, that's prophecy, shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. Satyrs? This is in last days Babylon context okay verse 22 and the wild beasts of the islands shall cry in their desolate houses and dragons in their pleasant places uh, palaces and her time is near to come and her days shall not be prolonged but wild beasts this is in the Septuagint the Septuagint version of that same verse we just read in King James gets a little bit more in depth for us it says but wild beasts shall rest there and the houses shall be filled with howling and monsters shall rest there and devils shall dance there and satyrs shall dwell there Okay, there's your Bible telling you about all kinds of chimeric creatures and monsters in the last days that are going to be uh, coming out of Babylon. Compare the Joel 2 army with the description of the locusts in Revelation 9. Read about this strange army in Joel chapter 2. If you put it side by side with the scriptures of the locusts coming out in Revelation 9, they're the same thing. However, there are people in the body of Christ here in the Metroplex that are preaching that they are the Joel 2 army. The new apostolic reformation movement for one. They're out there saying, we're the Joel 2 army. And they got, you know, all kinds of you know, dog tags and stuff saying they're the Joel 2 army. I'm like, dude, did you like actually read your Bible? Because they're Nephilim coming up out of the bottomless pit. <laughs> no. Christian, you are not part of the Joel 2 army. All right? They're Nephilim. Compare what um, Matthew 24, 37, where Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah. I just spent this whole presentation telling you what the days of Noah are like. Jesus himself tells you, guess what? Get ready. It's coming back. Let's talk about the locusts in Revelation 9. The Revelation 9 locusts are described as horseman. That equals centaur. Okay, they, they, they run like horses, right? They have human heads with uh, a human face with teeth like lions. They have uh, hair like women. They have wings. They have scorpion tails. And if you take Revelation 9 in context, how many of you heard about the 200 million man army? 
right? How many of you were taught that it's the Russians or the Chinese? Now some say the Muslims. Yeah. Pretty much everybody here? Yeah. That's what I heard. Again, open book test. The whole context is given to you about the locusts in Revelation chapter 9 and description of them. I believe they look something like the picture that I have there. When you get down to verse 9, 16, it's still in the context of the locusts and the king that rules over them, Apollyon, right? You get to verse 9, uh, 16, chapter 9, and the number of the army of the horsemen, horsemen, were 200,000 thousand, there's 200 million, and I heard the number of them. Horse man, here's the problem. Go on any website that tracks the horse population, the equestrian websites, any website that tracks the horse population will tell you there's at max, at the most, only 70 million horses on the entire planet. So either they've got to get busy and breed a whole bunch of horses for all those screaming Chinamen that they keep saying are going to come after us because they're horsemen. You know, some of the old, uh, or some of the Newsweek and Time magazine articles showed, yeah, China can field a 200 million man army. And so all the eschatology teachers said, it's the Chinese. No. Eschatology teacher, you need to study your Bible and read Genesis chapter 6. Because until you insert the Nephilim into your equation, all of your charts are wrong. All right? It's not the Chinese. It's not the Russians. It's not the Muslims coming down. It tells you they're horsemen. Horsemen. 70 million horses on the planet. Horsemen. We're talking about chimeric Nephilim creatures coming up out of the bottomless pit. 200 million of them in the last days at the fifth trumpet. Centaurs. When you look at the mythology, the centaurs, to drive this, home, this point home a little bit further, the centaurs uh, came from an individual named Centaurus, who was a son of Apollo. What does Revelation 9-11 say? The, the king over the locust, what's his name? Apollyon, which is a derivative spelling of Apollo. So it's telling you, we're talking about centaurs, chimeric centaurs coming up out of the bottomless pit. Uh, Septuagint, comparison with the King James in the Isaiah 13 passage, beginning in verse 1. The vision which Isaiah, the son of Amos, Amos, who's Amos? He's the guy that wrote about the Amorites being as tall as cedar trees, right? That's his dad. Okay, so Amos' sons saw a vision against Babylon, verse 2. Lift up a standard on the mountain of the plain, exalt the voice to them, beckon with the hand, open the gates, ye rulers, I give command and I bring them. Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath, rejoicing at the same time insulting. So at some point in Babylon, some guy is going to stand in front of some sort of stargate, open it up, and giants are coming through to fulfill God's wrath. Giants are coming back. The only biblical second incursion is the Archon invasion of the last days. I know a lot of teachers, you've probably heard them, some of them here, believe that there were multiple incursions after the flood. I'm like, prove it. The only biblical second incursion is in the last days context. It's Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, says that there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels, right? We know about that war, right? And then it kicks the devil out. Uh, Revelation 12, 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So that's when they get cast out. I believe you pick up the story in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? If you keep reading down to verse 21, you see something very interesting. Isaiah 14, 21. Prepare slaughter for his children. So the only biblical second incursion is in the last days. Michael goes up to heaven, kicks the devil and his angels out. They come down to earth, and apparently they have children because God says, prepare slaughter for, for them for the iniquity of their fathers that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the earth with cities. The pre-flood and post-flood giants built megalithic structures. These guys aren't going to get the opportunity to do that. God's going to wipe them out. This is the only biblical second incursion right here. So if anybody's trying to tell you you were married to a fallen angel or you're having Nephilim children or anything like that, forget it. It's, that's garbage. That's not true. Biblical second incursion is in the last days. You ever wonder why the devil is bound in chains for a thousand years? You ever wonder about that? You're always, I always like, why, why don't you just get it over with? Why don't you just throw him in the... Why is he get put in chains, put in prison for a thousand years, then gets let out for a little while, and then gets thrown finally into the lake of fire? I always wondered about that until I understood that we see in, in Second Peter and Jude, he says he, both of those guys re reference angels that left their first estate that are bound in everlasting chains of darkness, right? 
And in the Greek, when, when Peter's talking about the prison that they're bound in, it's Tartarus in Greek. Tartarus is the prison of the gods in the Greek mythology. Okay? The God-prescribed judgment for, mating with, for angels that mate with human is being bound in chains and put in Tartarus. That is the, the official judgment for any angel that mates with women. They get bound in chains and put in the prison of the gods that is called Tartarus. I just showed you why the devil gets put in chains and ends up going to Tartarus. It's right here. Because he mates with women. You know when you're driving down the street, the speed limit's 45, but you're doing 50, and a cop's there? You know, are you doing 55 or 60? What happens? There's the first initial fee for speeding, right? And then there's the add-on fees for every 10 miles or whatever over that, right? That is the city-prescribed judgment against you for the sin of speeding, right? The sin of angels mating with women is being bound in chains and put in Tartarus. That is why the devil gets bound in chains and put in Tartarus for a thousand years, because God has to be just. If he did the same judgment to these angels in Genesis 6, he has to do it to any other angel that mates with women, and that's exactly what happens. The devil comes down, mates with women, he gets bound in chains, put in Tartarus for a thousand years. After his prison sentence is up, he gets released, then he gets thrown into the lake of fire. Does that make sense? This message is very important, I believe. I'm going to keep coming back to this, Matthew 24, 37, because Jesus said our day is going to be like the days of Noah. We've got to understand this, especially if we're going through this thing called the tribulation, and we're going to see all these things, that men's hearts are going to fail them for fear of seeing these things. We don't need to be afraid. I'm going to, I'm going to encourage you again not to be afraid at the end of this. But we are actually trying to find a way, you know, we've had audiences in here, you know, pretty good-sized audiences in some of the conferences we've been to, but... There's 7 billion people on the planet that need to hear this. How are they going to hear it? It's got to go out to the masses. So churches aren't talking about it. I'm thankful for this church for allowing us to come here. Most churches would kick you out. They don't let, you, they don't let it happen. You know, thank God there are some people that allow us to speak in their church. All right? But nothing reaches the masses more than media, arts, and entertainment. Where does it tell anywhere in the Bible does it tell the world to go to the church? Anywhere? Hey, world, go to the church. What does it tell? What does it say to the church? Hey, church, go out to all the world. Where's the, where's the world? Well, the average American is watching four to five hours of TV a day. They're sitting in front of their TV. The average American is glued to their iPhones, iPads, and similar devices, listening to music, watching shows, and playing games. The average American spends nine billion dollars a year going to the movies. Go to your local Cinemark theater any time during any day of the week. You're going to see the parking lot full. You're going to see all the churches in the Metroplex, their parking lot's going to be empty, except for maybe Wednesday nights, you know, maybe Saturday and Sunday, you'll see cars in the parking lot. Cinemark's full all day, every day, seven days a week. Where's the world? Sitting in a parking lot, they're sitting in the movie theaters, <laughs> watching four to five hours of TV a day. That's why we're trying to create a TV series called Seed that will be science fiction. People don't watch episodic television to be preached to. If they want to be preached to, they'll surf to your, you know, your preaching channels. But the world ain't doing that. Yeah. You know, the world goes right past Joel Osteen and everybody else. Okay? But they're watching Fringe. They're watching V. They're watching the X-Files. They're watching all these shows that talk about the same subjects I'm talking about, but from their worldview, not giving hope to anybody. So we're trying to create a TV series where you can take all of this information and package it in a way that the world can actually receive it and make it happen. And it's got to be a grassroots effort because I can't go to the studios. If I go to ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, Sci-Fi Channel, they will censor me, control my content, have the ability to con cancel us prematurely and own the rights, and it's done. It's got to be done grassroots. Wow. So this is a huge vision. This is like God's like, real, he's, he put 72 episodes in my head. Wow. Wow. I've written two scripts and got a third one on the way, and we're trying to make this thing happen. But pray for us. God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. We're like, Lord, I don't even know how we're going to pay like our rent this month. <laughs> You're talking a million dollars an episode, really? But God called us, just like he called the Israelites to go into the land that was full of giants. So when it comes to facing the giants, whatever, they, whatever the future may hold for us with the strategic social initiative of 2045, you know, if, if Stan's right and this vision is right and we're here to the 2040s, we're going to see stuff. But that's why we need to spend time in the scriptures like this right here, Deuteronomy 3, 1 through 3. Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us. This is a scale representation of Og. 
how big Og of Bashan was compared to the Israelites. Came against us, he and all his people, so a whole army worth of these guys, to battle at Edri. And the Lord said unto me, Fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into thy hand. And thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, who was another big giant king that they had beat, beaten previously. It said they utterly destroyed him and all his people. So they already took, they already took out a whole tribe of giants which, thou, uh, which dwelt in Heshbon. And so the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og also, the king of Bashan, and all his people, and we smote him until none was left to him remaining. Those guys were no different than you and me. They just believed God, stepped out in faith, and faced the giants, just like Caleb did. Caleb, after he had to wander with all the doubters for 40 years, how old was he when he finally went in the land? 85? Okay, here's an 80-year-old guy. What did he say? He said, give me Kiriath Arba for his inheritance. Kiriath Arba? Arba was the father of Anak, the father of the Anakim that made themselves feel like grasshoppers by comparisons when they saw them. He said, give me the biggest of the biggest, the baddest of the baddest. I wanted to take those guys out 40 years ago. It's time to go take names. <laughs> I want Kiriath Arba. May we have the faith of Caleb. May we have the faith of Joshua. May we have the faith of David. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine giant speaking against my God? Give me five smooth stones. It's not because I might miss. Goliath had four brothers. I'm taking you out and your whole family. And this little shepherd boy went out there with a little slingshot. <whistles> took him down. Later, he and his mighty men took out the rest of them. They're no different than us, guys. We have to have that kind of faith, and I want to encourage you to get in your word, get in the scriptures, pray, and believe God. Thank you very much. And it would be a waste if you didn't get to heaven, having learned all of this. I believe there's going to be a time when America's in great turmoil. We have ignored such information, such truth, and such knowledge, and we've allowed all kinds of foolishness to come into our nation. And it, it is time, brothers and sisters, for us to come out of Babylon. It's for us, time for us to come out of the flesh and come out of this world. Okay, so for those people watching, and I believe there's going to, matter of fact, one of our speakers had a dream that God had showed him that there would be a time when people are huddled together watching DVDs. It wasn't shown that it was necessarily Prophecy Club DVDs, but DVDs that showed them about the last days, that showed them about the end times. And so it's real important for us to have on here the opportunity to receive Jesus. So for someone that has not received Jesus, how do you do that? All right, well, first of all, you have to realize is that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Next thing we have to realize is that we cannot earn our way to heaven. Ephesians 2.8.9 says, For it is by grace you are saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, if receiving salvation is a free gift, if we can't earn it, we can't buy it, we can't inherit it, how do we get it? Romans 10, 9, and 10 gives the answer. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What's that saying? It's simply saying it's not enough to say it and not believe it. It's not enough to believe it and not say it. We have to say it and we have to believe it. And then finally, Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the washing away of your sins. Remission of your sins and you, receive, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But here's the question. What does repent mean? See, a lot of people think that they, they, they only accept Jesus because they want to go to heaven. They don't accept Jesus because they want a God. They don't accept Jesus because they want to turn from their sins. So that's the first word. It says repent. So what is repent? Repent means that we ought to be turning away from the world things, the old things. There's going to be some words we lose, some friends we lose when we turn away from sin. 
If you'd like to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I'm going to pray a prayer here in just a minute. I'm going to ask everyone to pray it. I pray it every day. But before we do, let me just say, simply praying this prayer is not the last step. It's only the first step toward the road about being a Christian. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that cries, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those that doeth the will of the Father. In other words, we need to read that book, King James, read it, follow it, and do our best to... I mean, they called them Buddhists because they followed the teachings of Buddha. They called them Muslims because they followed the teachings of the Quran. Oh, but Christians, we don't have to go to church. We don't have to read the Bible. We don't have to follow the teaching of Jesus. All we got to do is say that little prayer. Uh-uh. I don't think so. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Let's pray. No one looking around, every eye closed. Let's all say it together. Dear Heavenly Father, I confess I'm a sinner. And I confess with my mouth, and I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, died on the cross, arose three days later. I receive His blood to wash my sins away, to write my name in the book of life, to keep me holy, and to save me in the day of trouble. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, one more step has to be done. Matthew 10.32 and 10.33 says, Whosoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father, which is in heaven. Whosoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. So it's real important for you that have either confessed Christ for the first time or maybe you, know, you confessed Him a long time ago, but maybe you fell away and you want to make a recommitment. It's real important to say it to another group of people or to say it to someone else. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. In just a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm not trying to embarrass you. It's not about that. To simply say the answer to one question. And here's the question I'll ask you. Who's your Lord and Savior? And here's the correct answer. Jesus Christ. So if you just prayed that prayer for the very first time you ever asked Christ into your heart, would you raise your hand? Okay. Is there any, anyone here prayed that prayer rededicating yourself? Would you raise your hand? Okay. Then would you please stand, you three, please stand. And the question is, who's your Lord and Savior? Okay, now let's give my congratulations. Thank you, please be seated. I prayed and I said, Lord, give us at least two today. We got three. Hallelujah. Do this. Read the Bible. Have a prayer closet. Come out of the world. Stop 